Okay. When we first read about uh, the church in Corinth, it's in Acts 18. Paul had uh, been through the area of uh, Thessalonica and Berea and other places, and did he have a bed of roses as he was traveling to those places? It was very rough. Rough, rough. And then he uh, traveled to Athens. And what's he known for in his, uh, what sermon is he known for from his time in Athens? Sermon on Mars Hill. And the people in Athens, they were, uh, I guess you could say they were spiritual in nature. But what was the, their problem with worshiping God? Okay, Larry says they had a bunch. I was going to say gods, plural. But they actually said they had a, a I'll call it a idol. In a, that's what it really was. It said it was to the unknown God. But he spent time there, and then he moved to the city of Corinth, which is further down along uh, that area of Greece. Let's see if I can see how to work this thing here. Carl, I don't know what I'm doing. There, ah, there we go. Lee has circled for us. These are Lee's slides that I'm uh, adjusting to. He has circled where the area of Athens was. And notice it's on, a, I think they call that an isthmus, a big, small area of land. And you had one sea, which I think is the Adriatic to the left, and then you had the Mediterranean Sea to the right. So it was kind of in a location uh, that was kind of like a uh, thoroughfare. People traveling right and left. These ships would come in. They'd get to the port. There'd be trade and so on. And that's where he was. He was in the city of Corinth. Now, the city of Corinth was not like Athens. The city of Corinth was known for what, anybody? Sin and uh, disagreements and evil and, and all kinds of things like that. It was not a good, good place. But when... But when Paul arrived there, it says there in Acts 18, he got to Corinth and he met up with two individuals that would be key workers with him in his time there. Verse 2 says he became acquainted with two Jewish people. It was a married couple, Aquila and Priscilla. Now they had been where before they came to Corinth? They had lived in Rome. And Roman oppression had driven them out, caused them to leave and depart. And they had come there to the area of Athens. Now, why did Paul become acquainted very well with them and actually develop a relationship? What was the common bond they had besides being Christians? Tent makers. They shared the same profession. So here are three individuals that had a common bond of being in Christ, but they also had the common bond that they had the same kind of secular job. So I, said, I can imagine they spent a lot and lot of time together. And uh, that, was, that was their job. Now, you see here also in those first few verses of chapter 18 that every Sabbath, every Sabbath, Paul was at the synagogue trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike about Jesus Christ. So when you think about that, a year and a half, 18 months, 52, 52 Sabbaths in a year, 26 more for a half, 78 times Paul would be going to the synagogue on, on the Sabbath or on Sunday also to teach to the people there about Christ. And he even had other co-workers besides Aquila and Priscilla. It says there in verse 5 that he was joined by Silas and Timothy. And they continued to preach and tell the truth. But was it also smooth sailing there? They had some opposition. And people rose up against them. Caused problems. Uh... This was, uh, Corinth was known as the capital of a province known as Achaia. And because of that opposition, Jews thought they could go to the Roman leaders and make an example of Paul and his followers. 
But that individual did not want to have anything to do with it. He said, I'm going to leave it to you. It was kind of like in, in his mind, the governor said it is a spiritual matter, your religion. I'm secular governor. You guys take care of them themselves. And it caused a lot of trouble for uh, Paul and his followers. Paul also, because he was upset with the reaction of the Jews to his teaching, it says there in verses uh, 5 and 6 of Acts, it says, Your blood is upon your own heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I will go preach to the Gentiles. And it says that he uh, met with a man named Titus Justus, who was a Gentile, and he lived right next door to the synagogue, and people believed. Now, Christ came, uh, had the God, uh, Christ came to Paul there in verse 9, and he says to him, it's going to be tough, tough things are going to happen. He says, do not be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack and harm you. For many people in the city belong to me. But yet, the governor Gallio, when the people came to him, he just did not want to get involved with it. He said, you need to take care of this yourself. And the crowd uh, basically went wild trying to harm Paul and his followers and caused a great, great problem. And they gathered up a man that we're going to read about in 1 Corinthians, a man by the name of Sosthenes, and he was the leader of the synagogue. And they beat him right in the courthouse. It's almost like saying you're in, in the courthouse downtown in Chattanooga. The judge says, it's out of my hands. I'm not going to do anything with this situation. And he steps and excuses himself out of the courtroom and takes all the security guards out of the courtroom. And then this group of individuals kind of take mob action uh, onto their own hands and, and uh, attack the people that are followers of Christ. Okay. That's kind of our introduction to Corinth. 18 months, Paul's there. And then he's, he's uh, on one of his other missionary journeys. And this, the first time Paul was there was on the second missionary journey. But then when we get over to 1 Corinthians, Paul writes this while he is in prison. And uh, he sends it to the church there in the city of Corinth. Now, Corinth is known as a uh, sin city. Very narrow isthmus, lots of sailors in town, and that's no dis a disrespect to sailors, but it was a, a situation where there was a lot of people coming and going. Lee says up there on his questions, uh, and I asked Jan this last night, I said, Jan, when you hear the phrase Sin City and you think about the United States, what comes to your mind? Debbie said Los Angeles, and that's exactly the answer Jan Beckham said last night, Los Angeles. We in the South might think a lot of places are Sin City compared to us. But when you think of Sin City, United States, what do you really think of sometimes? Las Vegas. Yeah, gambling, easy money, things like that. And I can just picture the difference between of Athens, where you had multiple gods, including the, the unknown god, to Corinth was difference in daylight and dark. And that was the kind of place that uh, Paul set, set up and uh, says there, Lee also says it had a reputation of being a completely wild city. So Lee's last point on that first slide is Paul had his work cut out for him. Would we consider that an ideal place to, uh, to go and establish an outpost, missionary outpost in today's world? might think it might be very difficult. We're here in the Bible Belt, the South, as that's what we kind of think of it, but uh, you go to a place where things are kind of like that, it would, not be a, a it would not be an easy situation. But yet, if you remember back to Acts 18, what did Christ tell Paul through that vision? What did he say he would face, or would he face any kind of harm to him? He would face tribulation, but he would, he would be with him. And yet, even though the conditions were difficult, he stayed there for a year and a half. Established a congregation there. I'll call it a congregation. And worked with people like uh, Priscilla and Aquila and uh, 
Paul and uh, T Titus and uh, T uh, Timothy, Silas, and they were there to make things as well as they could. Okay. Now, when uh, Paul had been there for that 18 months and then he moves on to the next spot on his, his journeys, he still had a bond for those Christians that were there in Corinth. So he takes the opportunity here as he's writing this epistle to reconnect with those believers, talk to them, and establish things. I'm going to let's read uh, the first five verses, or, or first three verses. It says five on the slide, but we'll just read the first three verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Sosthenes, that was the individual that had been beaten up in the courtroom there in, uh, in Corinth. I am writing to God's church in Corinth, to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. So, his readers in the church there in Corinth are called holy. They're trying to be the light in a very dark and difficult situation. Uh, they wanted to be different than the individuals in the town they were in. They were trying to live the light and, and shine in a very dark and dreary place. But Paul says that they need to be an example and to show Christ light to those individuals there and to be holy. How are we holy? What makes us holy? I think I heard it. Our relationship with Jesus Christ should make a difference in our lives and cause us that. And he also talks about that Jesus can give us grace and peace. When you think of peace, what, what comes to your mind in today's world? Thinking about the word peace. What you say, Pastor? Patty, I mean, not, not any peace. We have a lot of turmoil. I no longer take the paper, hardly look at the paper online, and don't really like to look at the news very often, unless it's a big story that really catches my attention. Because most of the news is very, it's just hard to, to uh, fathom. And uh, yet, we're told that we can have grace. And I think of the gift that we have given to us by Jesus Christ or through God, through his son, and that we can have peace. Um, you know, health comes into a play as you get older. Finances, family situations. Sarah? If we'll, okay, and, and Sarah is saying, with all that turmoil around us in 2022, or first century in Corinth, the sin city of uh, that part of Greece, you could still find inner peace through Christ, His Word, gift of the Holy Spirit, comfort. You just have to make that decision make that decision to, to walk in those paths. It's, uh, it's, it's not always easy. I take it for granted that when I come to church on a Sunday, there's going to be roughly 300 people here, like-minded, like faith, all together. But there's lots of thousands of congregations across our 50 states and across the, the going out for the United States. There's just handfuls of Christians getting together on Sundays. And I think, you know, I take a lot of things for granted that I'm going to see smiling faces, a good number of people here. And I'll be honest with you, that time we're here together on Sunday helps me, especially when I was in the work world. I, I, I needed to get my battery charged. 
needed to get it charged. Sunday, Wednesday night. Nowadays where I'm retired, I'm, I'm reading more at home in the, in the Word, trying to do activities, but it's not easy in today's world. We're, we're uh, being bombarded by Satan, just like these first century Christians were being bombarded here in, in Corinth. Brother Charles was mentioning the gospel song, Peace, Perfect Peace. The lyrics are very appropriate about what we receive from Christ. Um, regardless if you took on Christ in baptism as a youngster like I did, or you took on Christ in baptism late, late in life like Brother Bill Weaver did a few years ago, you get the same gift of comfort and peace and it all comes through that grace that's been given to us through Jesus Christ. Okay. Now we're going to read verses, I believe it's 3 through uh, three through 9. All right. Or 4 through 9. Paul says, and he's writing this again to the people that he'd spent 18 months with. He says, I always thank my God for you, for the gracious gifts he has been giving you, now that ye belong to Christ Jesus. Through him, God has enriched your church in every way with all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. This confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you'll be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus returns. God will do this, for he is faithful to do what he says, and he has invited you into the partnership we have with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, Paul had had rough times in Corinth when he was there, but he still could remember those that had been his co-workers, that had been left behind, he was thankful for the relationship that they had developed with each other, kind of a, a horizontal relationship there with the people in his congregation or fellow Christians. But together they also had this uh, vertical relationship with the Father and that they could share these things together. And he talks about the gifts that they had received in that church. Now, evidently... Uh, even though Paul talks later on in this chapter 1 about uh, eloquent words were not necessary what he should be known for, he comments to them and tells them and mentions that they have been blessed uh, with eloquent words and also they had knowledge. Now, I'm not much one of eloquent words, but what about knowledge? How can we as, as Christians in 2022 develop knowledge in God's word? Anybody? Bible study, prayer, and it could be Bible study in a, in a group situation like this. It could be individual Bible study at home. We have so many tools in today's world versus uh, maybe ones from a generation or two generations before. Uh, I, raised, I was raised at a time that I would go with my mom and dad for Bible studies and we'd use a film strip. Does anybody want to tell me what the name of that film strip was? Jewel Miller. And I had the opportunity many times as when the bell rang, Mark, you turned the, you turned the little uh, machine. They gave me the opportunity to be the, I'll call it the, the screen flipper. And we'd follow along in these books, and I always was fascinated as that was an opportunity to go to people that were, I'll just say, unchurched and talk to them about the Bible, God's Word. Now, I've got, I don't know how many versions. i got the Bible app, but I bet there's a hundred versions of the Bible on the Bible app, maybe more. And when they have this Right Now Media app, and I'll get things from Fried Harmon and other and, uh, Christian colleges, and, and, and you, you're just at... at uh, this, uh, we're, we're reading, we're reading uh, Luke and Acts, a chapter a week, 
in 2022. Well, I'll read the first verse every Thursday when we start a new reading. And then each day of the week to the next Wednesday morning, I choose a different version and try to compare how different translations show that. And I, I think I, I did not think I would ever have opportunities like that. I still remember mom and dad, when I went off to school, they bought me a set of what, anybody? Well, concordances is what I call them. And I can't even think. They were purple, J.W. McGarvey, and it, and it was it was a set. I still have that. But instead of pulling all concordances now, people go online to get that information. But these individuals did not have the kind of tools we had, yet they had heard the gospel through Paul and his co-workers. And it says that... Uh, because Paul knew of their words and their knowledge, it said, it confirms what I told you that Christ would do. It says there in verse 7, you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. I have to think about that verse. I think to myself, do I eagerly await Sometimes I get wrapped up in uh, things that are good, but I get I can get distracted. We have survived, Jan and I, our second week of grandchildren coming to see us. And they were here, this last group we had for six days. And as we drove back from Jackson Friday afternoon, Jan took a nice long nap in that car. And this morning, as I got up and got dressed first, I was sitting in the recliner, and I had dozed off waiting to come to church. Still trying to... Uh, recover is a poor word. Just trying to get used to it. In fact, she retired and went to the beach one week, and then she's had grandkids. We haven't had a normal... Uh, retired life as husband and wife yet so we're going to have to see how that is but uh, these individuals were eagerly awaiting I'd love to see my grandkids if I was given an opportunity to go pick them up today and bring them back of course I'd do it but I lived in a world thinking uh, my dad died at a young age would I live to, to an old, older life would I get to see kids get to see grandchildren and sometimes I get so wrapped up in those kind of things, I think, do I, am I eagerly waiting the return of the Lord? That should be the key thing I think about in my daily life. His return and trying to get other people to go with me, including children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren someday, Lord willing, and so on. All right. He says that Christ will keep you going to the end of our lives so that you'll be free from blame when the Lord returns, that we'll be ready for that judgment day and help us. And he says there toward the end of those first verses, he says, God's going to do this because he's what? Faithful. What he says, he means, and he lives up to it. I've made a lot of promises over my life. I ran into uh, Bob Zumbrun was here a few weeks ago. And I had to make a confession to him. I made it years ago, but I just had to remind him it was because I was telling on myself. Years ago, he let me borrow a book on Tony Dungy, autographed. Bob's a big Tampa Bay fan. That meant a lot for me to get to see that book. About a year later, where do you think that book still was? It was in my house. So I had to come to church one Sunday with my head hanging down like this and said, Bob, I should have returned this a long time ago. You know, it's got, I said I would bring it back in a short period of time, and it became just forgot. But God in his promise to us is faithful to us. He's, what he says goes and what he means. And it says there, too, that we have a partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I think about uh, in our household, uh, my wife and I, we, we have uh, been fortunate to be blessed with children and tried to raise them as we should, but it was just not us. It was with Christ or the Lord at the pinnacle 
and then us coming down below him. And I think about what he says, how this church was working in Corinth, that everything was a partnership between them and the Lord. All right. We're going to move on now. I think it's verses 10 through uh, 17. Paul now talks about an issue that is causing uh, problems in his mind when he thinks about the congregation that he had helped establish on his second journey there in Corinth and issues that they were having. He says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. What's it mean to have harmony with one another? What's that? All in the same accord. Unity. He says, let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. What was it? The uh, Might have been in 1850s when Abraham Lincoln was not running for president. He was running for the Senate of Illinois. And he was having debates with Stephen Douglas. And he would quote scripture, kind of what this same principle was talking about here. Does anybody remember what he would quote in his speeches? He was foreseeing in his mind in 1850s that this country would be split asunder over the issue of slavery. And I think Abraham Lincoln was known for the verse he quoted was, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And that makes me think that's what Paul is saying here. The church had been established in Corinth. The church had been established on the day of Pentecost. One mind, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. It was supposed to be unified. He was upset because of what he had heard. Instead of them being united in thought and purpose, I would say they were uh, fractions. They had spoke, broken out into fraction groups. So here's what he says there starting in verse 10, 11. He says, for some members of Chloe's household, and that's evidently a family that was living there in Corinth, had told him about quarrels. And it says, these were quarrels that my dear brothers and sisters are having in Corinth. Some were saying I'm a follower of Paul. Others are saying I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only in Christ. What does it sound like was their issue there? Anybody? Pride? Almost kind of uh, maybe a pecking order. If I had been baptized by this person, it may be a little higher up in the pecking order that somebody was going to do there. Uh, almost like it's your pedigree type of deal and uh, that is not the purpose of what the church was earlier Paul had said uh, and correct me if I got the order wrong I planted Apollos watered but God granted what the increase that was what he was always doing in his missionary journeys when he went out with, with a group it was not to join the sect of Paul but it was to join the Lord's church and he says when he brings up this point he says uh, has Christ been divided into factions was I Paul crucified for you were any of you baptized in the name of Paul and you know he's asking those questions and they're ridiculous questions but it is also sad because that's how it appeared when he got his report back from his friend Chloe of what was going on in Corinth. People were hung up on how they had come into the church and it was causing a real major issue with those people in Corinth. And Paul... Yes. Okay. Okay. And, and 
and uh, unfortunately, sometimes people, even today, are not really listening and studying and following what's being said. Sometimes they're more wrapped up in the delivery, or we'll say somebody, you know, they're kind of charismatic, and and we can get misdirected from where our thoughts really should be on the message more than the messenger. Uh, and I'm not saying Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ was the original messenger, but people can be misdirected. Point of the pyramid, that's correct. And uh, he says there, it had gotten so bad, Paul says, of course not. I'm, no one was baptized in my name. He says, I thank God that I did not baptize you in any. He mentions two people, uh, Crispus and Gaius. And he says, then he mentions one other family that he had baptized, uh, the uh, family, I think it's Sosthenes, or Stephanus. He says, I don't remember baptizing anybody else. And then he, he tells them this. He says, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. Now, when I read that at first, I kind of think, well, we're all told to go out into all the world and to teach the gospel to every living creature. But I can understand the logic of that. I also thought about that verse where Paul had said, I planted, Apollos watered, God granted the increase. Plant the seed, and there will be results of it. But Paul did not want to have the main effort of his ministry to be about him. It should have been about him with a capital H. And uh, he talks about the good news, good news for modern man. The gospel means good news. And he says, uh, I don't want to be known for my clever speech because if I did, it would uh, cause the cross of Christ to lose its power. He didn't want anything to happen that would take their mind off being focused on Christ and his message not on the individual. Any thoughts or comments on that? Okay. We'll move on to the next verses there that Brother Lee has set up. These are verses 18 through 23. Now, Paul is in writing to individuals that are not in Athens in, in the area of Greece, but this is in the city of Corinth, but Greece is known for philosophy, wisdom, scholars. It's been that way for uh, thousands of years. But he says here, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved notice the very power of God. The scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this, excuse me, so when does this leave, or where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish, since God, in his wisdom, saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven and is foolish for the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. He wanted the people to focus upon the word of God. And I remember reading in the, in the uh, gospel accounts, uh, the people would see miracles and they would see signs and what would they come back for? Did they want to see Christ or hear his teachings? What would they want to come back for? They wanted to see more miracles and, 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 and signs like that. Uh, it's like when he, after he fed the 5,000. Did they understand the grass, the difference between physical food and spiritual food? Absolutely not. They were still hung up on what they'd seen. How did he feed so many people with so few loaves and fishes? and they were misfocused. And he talks about these Jewish people here at this time were in that same situation. They wanted to see signs from heaven. 
I recently was reading the story about uh, Philip and Simon the sorcerer. Simon had been baptized, but he had not received the gift of the Holy Spirit. James and John are sent down there. I think it's Peter. Peter and John are sent down there to the city. And they give the power of the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands. And what's the reaction of Simon? He wanted it so bad, what was he willing to do? Pay for it. He had no concept of what it could do and how you should get it. He just saw how great it looked. And basically he's doing even more than he had done because he was known for his so-called magic that he thought he could purchase that. He just had a total wrong concept. And that's kind of what Paul's talking about here. People were excited about reaching or thinking about the signs and the wonders and the miracles that they had seen. Now, what did Paul say about the teaching of the gospel sometimes? Why was it foolish to some people? They could not understand the thought that... Uh, when they thought about the Messiah, what did they think was going to happen? Earthly kingdom, overcome the Romans, come in on a, uh, like David, King David, same lineage, the same family of King David, thought they'd retake the world. And then when you're told that the Messiah was a carpenter's son, uh, he lived, lived a nomadic life for the, best, the last three years of his life, life on earth, age 30 to 33, and traveled around, had really no place to put his head, no roof over his head, and that he died on a cross like the criminals did? Would that make sense to a philosopher, a person who had studied, and so on? Not really. That would be above their comprehension. And it caused issues and he says there at the end of that in verse 23, so he says, when I preach Christ was crucified, uh, crucified on the cross, buried and rose from the grave, he says, the Jews are offended by that because they think about the, what was going to happen in their mind when the kingdom was going to come again and drive out the Romans. And the Gentiles just said that is just a fable. It doesn't make any sense to us all with our knowledge and logic. Okay. We will stop there and leave. Well, now, next week, all, of, all classes for adults will meet in the auditorium because we'll have a guest speaker. Um, thank you. Mike Glover will be here with his wife, Pumi, and he will speak to combined classes and then preach to us at the, at the 10 o'clock hour. And then Lee might be back that next week or it'll be me again. I hope you have a good day. And uh, thank you for your attention.